Hi, I'm Dr. Mae Seibel, editor of My Menopause Magazine. I've just returned from Dallas, Texas in the annual meeting of the North American Menopause Society and I had a chance to have a discussion with Dr. Isaac Schiff, who's the chairman at Mass General Hospital, and he's been the sole editor of Menopause, the medical journal that's the premier journal in the world. In this reflection of the last 20 years, he's going to tell us about how things have changed in menopause research over the last two decades. Okay, let me just start by asking you to state your name. Isaac Schiff. And you are? Uh, Chief of the Vincent Obstetrics and Gynecology Service at the Massachusetts General Hospital. And also editor for 20 years of the journal Menopause, which is the premier premier journal in, for the whole field of menopause, and I think the world considers it the number one journal for that field. Well, thank you very much. Just the truth. So let me just ask you, one of the things I thought, this is your 20th year as editor-in-chief of that journal, and so much has happened in the last 20 years. I wonder if you could comment on some of the things that you see as the huge, the biggest changes, you know, things, trends, meds, perceptions, anything that you think that might be game changers over the last 20 years. Sure, uh, and uh, it, it's very interesting because there have been changes in the way healthcare providers take care of their patients, changes in the way patients have expectations from their providers, and just changes within the research community. I must say that over 20 years ago, that estrogens, for example, when dealing with menopause, the automatic thought was hormone therapy. And every woman who came to see her healthcare provider was spoken to about hormones. And I mean spoken to because the providers were very aggressive about suggesting to their patients that they take hormones. The women did have some input into whether or not they were going to be treated, but very often they just listened to their physicians. And there was the book Feminine Forever, and there were a lot of positive things about estrogen. Very few of the side effects or complications were known. A number of studies came out which had suggested that estrogens were very good for people to take. But of course, they were all observational studies. And I had my own particular concerns that it may have been related to the healthy user effect. Namely, the healthiest women were the ones who were taking hormones, and the healthiest women were the ones who healthcare providers felt comfortable to give them therapy. Now you did a lot of studies yourself on estrogen that I recall very well. Yes, and, and I did, and I was involved in studies to show that it helps with sleep behavior in women who have hot flashes. It uh, showed that estrogens placed intravaginally can be absorbed, and I suspect it may have been one of the features that led to the introduction of transdermal estrogens. And, and I had done a fair number of studies looking at alternatives for estrogens to treat hot flashes. But as a pendulum swings, it tends to overswing. And I think that hormones had too much positive publicity going into the 1980s. In fact, I remember very clearly that cardiologists would refer women with heart disease to me for the use of estrogens. And I wrote back to them and said, I wouldn't use estrogens for this person. I would suggest that you use your drugs in your armamentarium, such as lipid-lowering drugs or antihypertensives, which have a better track record for treating heart disease. Nevertheless, it was such a, a strong feeling that hormones were the fountain of youth and that they could cure everything or prevent everything. And then we started to see some studies that were randomized where there was no physician bias. And these randomized trials, first starting with the HERS study, looking at hormones in women who already had heart disease to try to prevent another event. And I recall that the person who presented the information when I first heard it 
was so shocked because it didn't show hormones prevent. In fact, if anything, it increased it in the first few years. And this particular individual was so upset and so emotional about it because it went against everything she thought. And the HERS trial was interesting because it was first set up for five years. In the first few years, it, the hormone compared with the placebo actually caused more events. By the end of the fifth year, the, there were more events in the placebo group. So what would you tell your patient? Take hormones. Uh, the first two years might not be so good for you, but if you make it past the first two years, you're going to be golden, you're going to be in great shape. And I think that's what some doctors even told their patients. Nevertheless, along came the WHI. Now the WHI, or Women's Health Initiative, was supposed to answer the question about physician bias, namely that we were giving hormones to the healthiest women. And the Women's Health Initiative really came out of the fact that the NIH recognized that women weren't taking part in clinical trials. For example, out of Boston came this study in male physicians showing that aspirin might prevent heart disease. But the study wasn't done in women. Women were not included, so we'll never know if aspirin would be good for women or not good for women. So the Women's Health Initiative was supposed to be helpful in that way. If I, in retrospect, I have a constructive criticism of the Women's Health Initiative. It was supposed to answer the question, if you randomize women to either treatment or no treatment, you're going to find out, assuming no physician bias, as to whether or not hormones prevent chronic disease. So if you have to change one thing and one thing only, it should be the drug that you're using and that's all, and it should be prescribed in the same way as all the observational trials. All the observational trials were done with either Premarin alone in the United States or Premarin and Provera in cyclic fashion. And, and they were given to women right after menopause because these are the women who are most symptomatic. What did they do in the WHI? They changed multiple parameters. They used a drug called Prempro, for which there was no observational data. We didn't know anything about it, whether it would be good for the heart or not good for the heart, so I don't know why they chose Prempro. And the second feature is they chose women age 63. Now, if you go back to the 70s, nobody started women on hormones at age 63. Right. And so they chose, they had so many parameters that were changed that the WHI did not give us the answers that were so critical and we're now trying to tease out the information from the WHI and the people who did it were excellent investigators but frankly I wouldn't have chosen that drug and I wouldn't have chosen the older population. So you've seen the studies evolve where estrogen has gone from great for everyone to really not so great for anyone right. to coming back to really good in, in the right situation. Correct, and that's the point. The pendulum overswung, and what we're seeing over the last 10 years is a rush to treat women with agents other than estrogens, thinking that the new agents, if they're new, are going to be safer. We don't know if they're going to be safer. Estrogens have been around for decades. We know a lot about hormones. 50 or 60 years. You're right. For example, take a Lendronate. Everybody thought it's safe for bones, it's just going to prevent fractures, it's going to be wonderful. Well, it, first of all, it doesn't prevent all the fractures. And then it had to be around for a number of years before we started to see very strange fractures that weren't occurring before. And now we have a multitude of drugs coming out, all thought to be safe. They've been studied for three months, six months, a year, two years, and very few side effects or complications. But I don't know, and I don't think anybody knows what the long-term effects are. I'm not a psychiatrist, but if you look at agents like SSRIs, which are now being used for hot flashes, and women might be getting them for 10 or 20 years, 
I don't know what that's going to do to somebody's cognitive behavior after 10 or 20 years of a drug that affects neurotransmitters. I would question it, yet we prescribe SSRIs with a lot of confidence for women who have bad hot flashes. These are some and of the antidepressants. Correct. Let me ask you this. So you th you're saying that in some ways what you're saying is, is that the devil you know is sometimes safer than the devil that you don't know. Sometimes. I, I just, w what I would like to say is that people are treating estrogens as if it's a very dangerous drug. It definitely has complications. It definitely has side effects. But perhaps in a lower dose, it might be effective for hot flashes for a few years to help a woman through the transition of perimenopause when she might be at increased risk for depression and the hot flashes are very troubling for her and it might help her through that difficult time. And it, I'd like to put in perspective that it ought not to be used to prevent heart disease or the other things that it was thought to do. On the other hand, there is a place for it and before I'd start prescribing multiple new drugs that have just been on the market for a year or two, I think people should reconsider estrogens. Let me ask you this in closing. If you have, if you're a person, you're a woman in the community, you're a person trying to decipher all the latest that's coming out from the medical journals because we often see it first in, in laboratory animals, and then we see it in some limited clinical trials, and eventually we see it in clinical trials, and then tremendous headlines about it. How does the average person go about trying to tease out the news from what to use? I think it's very difficult for the average person to get the information because there's a publication bias. If something is very bad about a drug, chances are the major newspapers are going to put it on the front page. If it's neutral, patients will not hear about it. It's very difficult for a person who's not in the medical profession or who doesn't have access to that, all the information to make that decision. That's why it's so important that they connect with a healthcare provider who is up to date who could share that information with them. The internet, there's very little editorial control over it. We don't know what's accurate, what's inaccurate from the internet. I think it really still comes down to the woman sitting down with her health care provider, even in these challenging times where everybody feels rushed and have to go through and make an individual choice for that woman. The woman has to be given all the information from the health care provider and in a partnership they have to decide whether it's in her interest or not to be treated. It doesn't have to be estrogens, it could be multiple features, but attention also has to be placed to lifestyle. For example, can't overestimate exercise. When I uh, speak to patients, for example, and they want to know whether they ought to take a drug for osteoporosis or bones, I tell them that more important than even the drug is to be street smart, to make sure that if they go to the bathroom during the night that there's a little light on so that they don't trip or fall, that if it's icy outside, they don't go outside. If they have to go outside and it's icy, wear a long coat so that if they fall, the fall might be, um, the, the trauma of the fall might be absorbed by the coat. So you have to be proactive in your lifestyle as well as your medication. Absolutely. Pills are not going to solve everything. Well, thank you very much. Is there any other point you'd like to make? No, except you're a great guy and uh, you have an outstanding program. Thank you so much. So thank you for letting me be a part of it.